An Italian traveler, Pietro della Valle, was traveling through the Middle East in the 17th century. His journey took him to Asia, North Africa, India, and other parts of the Near East. While traveling through Persia in modern Iraq, della Valle often relied on local guides who knew the terrain and could negotiate with the tribal groups for safe passes. At this time, Ottomans and Persians were at war over territories like Baghdad. De La Valle memoirs vividly describes his interaction with various Persian tribesmen during his journey. One of the most dramatic moments occurred when De La Valle had to hide from Kurdish tribesmen, who were known for raiding and taking traveler hostages. While searching for a place to hide, they took shelter under a hill near the ruins of ancient building. While there, De La Valle began looking around and saw it was built with high-quality bricks, encrypted with mysterious ancient looking inscriptions. The inscription De La Valle encountered were written in cuneiform, a wet shaped writing system used by ancient civilizations in Mesopotamia and Persia. Realizing the importance of the inscriptions, despite not understanding their meaning, De La Valle copied several of the cuneiform characters in his journal. While he was unaware, the inscription he had just come across was once spoken by hundreds of thousands of inhabitants of the ancient city of Ur, one of the city-states of history's first civilization known as Sumer. This lost civilization laid the groundwork for much of what we understand in today's world. De La Valle collected a few of these clay tablets scattered around the ruins of Ur and brought them back to Europe in 1621, which were among the first Sumerian artifacts to be brought to Europe. The Rosetta Stone was a total game changer when it came to figuring out ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was like finding a secret codebook. This rock had the same message written in three different scripts, hieroglyphics, demotic and ancient Greek. Since scholars already knew how to read Greek and demotic, it acted like a guide by comparing the identical text across the scripts. Scholars like Jean-Francois Saint-Polion could decipher the meaning of the hieroglyphics, a feat that had puzzled humanity for over a millennium. Similarly, cuneiform used in Mesopotamia needed its own version of the Rosetta Stone to unlock its secret. This breakthrough came in 1835 through the work of Henry Rawlinson. While he was in the Zagros mountain of Iran, Rawlinson encountered the Behi Stone inscription, a massive text carved into a cliff in three different languages. Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian. These languages had been forgotten for centuries and no one knew how to read them. Fascinated by the inscription, Rawlinson carefully copied the cuneiform text into his notebook, determined to unlock its secret. Over the years, he finally cracked the Old Persian section of the cuneiform. This was possible because Old Persian was relatively well understood due to its connection with modern Persian and other Iranian languages. Once he deciphered Old Persian, Rawlinson used it as a key to unlock the more complex Elamite and Babylonian section of the inscription. His discoveries were groundbreaking. He confirmed that Babylonian and Elamite had distinct origins and were completely separate languages. Babylonian, he determined, belonged to the Akkadian language family, spoken in ancient Mesopotamia. Before Rawlinson's big discovery, everyone thought all cuneiform writing was in Semitic languages like Akkadian. What he didn't know though was that his work would eventually lead to the discovery of an even older language than Akkadian. Between 1842 and 1851, two archaeologists, Paul Emil Botta from France and Austin Henry Layard from Britain, laid a big excavation in what's now Mosul. Their work uncovered the ancient ruins of Nineveh, which was once the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the most powerful empire in ancient Mesopotamia at the time. In the ruins of Nineveh, they found what was left of the Assyrian palaces, but the real treasure was the library of Asurbanipal. Thousands of clay tablets were covered in cuneiform writing, mostly in Akkadian, the language of the Assyrian Empire. But mixed in with these were tablets, written in a much older and mysterious language no one had seen before. Edward Hinks, a highly skilled linguist, realized through years of research that Babylon, Assyria, and Elam had borrowed their writing system from non-Semitic speaker. These speakers were later named Sumerians by Jules Oppert, 
establishing the Sumerian language as a distinct from Semitic languages. Meaning, the Sumerian language is a language isolate that does not belong to any known language family. Later Hinks, along with the other scholars, helped to identify that cuneiform writing was invented not by the Akkadians but by the Sumerians. He deduced this based on the significant difference in the grammar and phonetics between Sumerian and Akkadian, confirming that Sumerian was a separate and older language. Things were heating up in the archaeological world and the Americans were eager to conduct their own excavations. Between 1888 and 1900, multiple American expeditions took place to the Near East. One big find from this expedition was uncovering 50,000 cuneiform tablets the largest collection of Sumerian writing ever discovered. People still debate whether the Sumerians were native to southern Mesopotamia or came from somewhere else. Especially since no Sumerian DNA has been found yet. But one thing is clear. The Sumerian grew out of Neolithic farming communities and gradually shifted from nomadic life to settled towns. By around 4000 BC, they would establish themselves in the fertile land between Tigris and Euphrates River. Some theories hint they may have originated in Anatolia, modern day Turkey, as some of the earliest settlements have been discovered there, and then they migrated south into Mesopotamia. Another theory suggests that the Sumerians were descended from the Ubayat people, who preceded them by roughly 2500 years. The Ubayid people are thought to have lived near the Zagros mountain, which runs through what's now Iran, Iraq and Turkey, just east of Mesopotamia. Evidence of early settlements, cave paintings, pottery, stone vessels and grinding tools has been discovered in the foothills of Zagros mountains. It is possible that these mountain people eventually migrated south to Mesopotamia, perhaps in search of food or because of climate change. Based on the numerous statues, sculptures, wall paintings, and royal tombs created by the Sumerians, we can gain insight into the appearance and outfits of the Sumerian people. The Sumerians referred to themselves as a black-headed people. Statues found at various Sumerian sites like Pursu and Ur depict the appearance of Sumerians. Men typically had shaved heads with stocky bills and broad shoulders. Some statues such as those found from the temple of Abu at the Tel Asmar show Sumerian worshippers with almond-shaped eyes, beardless faces, and bare feet. Wall carvings depict Sumerian women wearing long robes and tunic, while men often wore a type of wraparound skirt called kunakis, both made from sheepskin. Women had long braided hair, while men usually shaved their heads or kept their hair short on the sides. Kings and priests wore cylindrical headdresses and colorful ornate robes. Both women and men adorned themselves with jewelry such as necklaces, anklets, beads, earrings, and bracelets made from copper and sometimes gold. Women even used cosmetics such as eyeshadow and lipstick. Around 8,000 years ago, the climate in Mesopotamia began to change, becoming warmer and drier. This shift made hunting and gathering more challenging as traditional food sources become less abundant. The region between the Tigris and Euphrates River known as the Fertile Crescent offered fertile soil and abundant water resources. Some of the earliest known communities such as the Ubayat people settled in this area and thrived. Floodplain agriculture became common for growing crops, relying on the natural flooding of the rivers. Farmers would plant seeds in the floodplain during the receding waters, allowing the nutrient-rich yield to nourish the crop. However, this technique was unpredictable, as the timing and intensity of the floods could vary. Over time, the Ubayat people made a crucial discovery that would change society profoundly. They realized they could dig channels to divert water from Tigris and Euphrates, allowing them to cultivate land farther from the rivers. This innovation allowed them to grow crops in various locations and led to the establishment of permanent mud brick villages. One of these villages soon transformed into a city known as Erdu, which is one of the earliest known cities in Mesopotamia, dating back to around 5400 BCE. 
It had a population of roughly 10,000 people and was ruled by a priest king known as the Ensi. As a priest, the Ensi was believed to have a direct connection to the divine, while as a king, they were responsible for the city's economy and defense. At this point in history, few woolly mammoths still roam the remote part of the world. To the south lay an ancient marsh landscape from where the greatest Sumerian cities rose. The Sumerian heartland was a fertile land formed by the sediments of Tigris and Euphrates rivers, deposited over millennia. To the north of Sumer lay Akkad, another region in Mesopotamia. The southern end of Sumer extended towards the Persian Gulf, while the Zagros mountain bordered it to the east and the Syrian desert to the west. The climate was harsh, with hot and dry conditions often reaching temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. The Sumerian landscape was dominated by vast plains, lacking many natural resources such as wood and stone. To survive in such a challenging environment, the Sumerians had to be exceptionally creative and resourceful people. The river banks of Tigris and Euphrates deposited vast amount of mud, which the Sumerian people learned to use in making bricks. They mixed mud with straw for added strength, shaped the mixer into a rectangular mold, and then either sun-dried or oven-fried the bricks. These bricks were used to build houses, temples, palaces, and city walls. A notable example is the ziggurat of Ur, which still stands after 5,000 years. This is structure built entirely from mud bricks, served as a temple for worshipping the moon god Nana. In addition to building materials, Sumerian used mud bricks for making pottery, sickle, and cuneiform tablets. Instead of wood, they made ingenious use of reeds, bundling and tying them together to construct houses, boats, mats, baskets, pottery wheels, and paints for writing on cuneiform tablets. The Sumerians are also credited with developing some of the earliest form of arches and domes in construction. Innovation that influenced later civilizations such as Babylonians, Assyrians, and eventually passed down to the Egyptians and Romans. They were among the earliest people to cast copper and later bronze. By combining copper with tin, they created bronze, a stronger and more durable metal. In time, Sumerian adopted and even improved upon the irrigation technique. They designed complex system of canals with dams constructed of reeds, palm trunks, and mud whose gates could be opened or closed to control the flow of water from Tigris and Euphrates River. Over time, Iraq's landscape underwent a dramatic change, transforming from a dusty, swampy terrain to a lost patchwork of farmland. These canals were also used for transporting goods and people along the Tigris and Euphrates River, using boats made out of reeds and barges. On land, the Sumerians are credited with creating some of the oldest wheeled vehicles, dating back to around 3500 BCE. These early cars and chariots, typically pulled by donkeys or oxen, were essential for moving heavy loads between the cities. The most innovative invention of Sumerians was plow and seed sowing machines, which increased their efficiency. By creating complex networks of irrigation canals and improving farming tools, the Sumerians were able to irrigate larger areas of land, increasing agriculture output significantly. The primary crops of Sumerians were barley and wheat, but they also grew dates, onions, figs, palms, pomegranates, apples, and grapes. Surplus crops were stored in granaries, which helped Sumerians survive during years of poor harvest. Crops like barley were also fermented to make beers. Beer was consumed by all classes of Sumerian society and it was often safer to drink than water, as the fermentation process made it more hygienic. It was even used as a form of payment. They even had a goddess of beer named Ninkasi, and the famous Haim to Ninkasi is one of the oldest surviving records of a beer recipe. In Sumerian society, a barter system was used to exchange goods for resources they needed. Sumer didn't have a coinage system yet. It won't appear for another 2000 years. Instead, silver and gold became a standard measure of value. A sickle of silver was a specific weight, roughly 8.5 grams, and over time it became a reference point for pricing goods. Sumer had many trading partners. It imported silver, copper, and tin from Anatolia. 
Lapis lazuli, carnelian beads, and ivory from Egypt and India, and Sumerian exported grains and textiles in return. Arguably the most important trading partner was Elam, where Sumer traded stones and wood, which it desperately lacked. Sumerian tablets from the Royal Library of Ebla discovered in the 1970s contained detail about administrative records of exchanges involving grains, metal, timber, and lapis lazuli between Sumer and Ebla. Similarly, tablets from Nippur showed how temples acted as a bank, and this document details loan repayment and exchange of goods. When merchants made deal, the agreements would be recorded on clay tablets. To finalize the deal, each party would roll their seal over the clay tablet, serving as their signature. This provided legal protection for both parties, ensuring that the terms were accepted. People could also borrow grain and silver and pay them back with interest developing an earlier form of the credit system. The Sumerian had a mysterious connection with a vibrant blue stone called lapis lazuli. Its unique color pattern with its deep blue hue might have reminded people of the night sky, leading them to believe that the gods of heaven resided within the stone. This comparison might lead them to believe that the stone embodied the soul of the gods. They were used in temples especially for the eyes of the statues, which were believed to channel divine wisdom and power. In the royal tombs of the Sumerian city of Ur, archaeologists discovered items like a dagger with a lapis handle and a bowl inlaid with lapis. Here's the unexpected part. This stone did not occur naturally in Sumer, but was imported from the mines in the Badakhshan region of modern-day Afghanistan and the Hindukus mountain over 1,000 miles away. This trade route connected Mesopotamia, Central Asia, and possibly South Asia long before the rise of Sumerian civilization. Some theories suggest that people from the Eastern Highland may have migrated to the Sumerian plains, bringing skills in agriculture, craft, and administration, which contributed to the genetic and cultural diversity of Sumer. The stone held similar spiritual significance in ancient Egypt, where it was believed to protect the wearer in the afterlife and was used in the creation of Tutankhamun's funerary mask. Because lapis was a rare and imported material, it was mainly accessible to priests and kings, who used it for cylindrical seals, important gifts, or just as a symbol of wealth and divine power. Besides being skilled tradesmen, the Sumerian were also accomplished mathematicians. They are credited with creating the first multiplication tables, which laid the groundwork for the mathematical concepts we still use today. The Sumerian number system was based on sexagesimal or base 60 rather than the decimal number system that we use today, which uses base 10. The choice of base 60 was practical because 60 is divisible by many numbers, making calculations involving fractions and divisions more manageable, especially when dividing lands and goods. The base 60 system had a lasting impact, particularly on how we measure time. The Sumerians divided the day into 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime, and each hour into 60 minutes. Additionally, their division of a circle into 360 degrees is another enduring legacy of the numerical system. The Sumerian star map, also called the Planisphere, discovered in Nineveh, features one of the oldest surviving representations of the celestial bodies and their positions in the night sky. One of the most significant inventions in human civilization was created by the Sumerians. The Invention of Writing Sumerian scribes used soft clay tablets as a writing surface, which was pressed by a stylus made out of reed. This system of writing, called cuneiform writing, initially began as a tool for record keeping, especially in trade and inventory, tracking resources like grains, livestock, and labor around temples, which were represented in pictures and symbols or ideas so everyone could understand what they represented. This earliest writing system was called pictograph and dates back to 3400 BCE during the Uruk period in ancient Mesopotamia.
over time as the need for writing increased with the growth of trade and administration the pictograph became simpler to allow fast writing this led to a set of symbols that could be easily identified and copied which was essential for communication across the growing sumerian city states some symbols began to represent sounds rather than specific objects for instance a symbol that originally depicted an eye would come to represent the sound e or i this meant it was easier to write i or e rather than draw a whole eye an ancient mesopotamian poem tells the earliest known story of how writing was invented because the messenger's mouth was heavy and he couldn't repeat the message the lord of kalaba patted some clay and put words on it like a tablet until then there had been no putting words on clay the transaction from writing to literature will take hundreds of years nevertheless by 2700 bc a number of libraries had been established one notable of such literature is the famous flood story found in the epic of gilgamesh the epic of gilgamesh inscribed on clay tablets around the 18th century bce tales of a great flood sent by the gods to destroy humanity in this story a hero named utnapishtim builds a boat to save his family and various animals a narrative strikingly similar to the story of noah's ark in the bible which was written over a thousand years later Sumer was highly prone to flooding due to its location in the Mesopotamian floodplain. Seasonal rains and melting snow from the mountains in Anatolia led to unpredictable flooding of these rivers. Perhaps this frequent flooding inspired the poet of ancient Sumer. Sir Leonard Woolley, a British archaeologist, conducted a significant excavation at the ancient Sumerian city of Ur in the 1920s and 1930s. During these excavations, Wooly discovered a layer of silt about 8 feet thick between two settlements without the Sumerian artifacts. This layer indicated a sudden flooding event that briefly paused human settlement at Ur, which he believed to be the evidence of a major flood. Wooly initially linked this finding to the flood stories in Mesopotamian mythology, such as those in the Epic of Gilgamesh. They were also keen observer of the heavenly bodies. The Sumerians saw the universe as a dome over a flat earth surrounded by a salty sea. Beneath the earth was an underworld where spirit of the dead lived. And under that was a fresh water ocean. Temples were the center of religious life in Sumerian society. Priests became the wealthiest and most powerful class since they owned large number of lands. and were among the largest landholder in sumer they managed agricultural production on temple lands collecting offerings tributes and taxes in the form of crops and livestock many kings themselves were originally military leaders or high priest they had not conceived the idea of heaven and hell eternal rewards and punishment rather they believed in physical rewards in this life The tablets of Gudea are currently housed in the Louvre Museum in Paris, which lists the object which gods preferred. It includes oxen, sheep, goats, doves, chickens, fish, and dates. Earlier Sumerian society even sacrificed humans, but as the time changed, human flesh was replaced by lamb. The Sumerian graves were discovered in some ruins that had food and tools which might suggest they believed in an afterlife. At the top of the Sumerian society hierarchy was the king followed by the nobles and priest. The majority of the population were commoners while slaves formed the lowest class who were either captured in wars or people who were sold into slavery for debt. Men held more power in Sumerian society than women. but they still had notable rights they could own property run business and serve as priestesses one notable figure anhe duana was a high priestess of the sumerian moon god nana and was the daughter of sargon of akkad the ruler who founded the akkadian empire she is often regarded as one of the first known author in history 
as a high priestess and a poet. Enheduanna helped the Akkadian dynasty control Sumer by connecting the Sumerian and Akkadian people. Majority of women were engaged in large-scale weaving, which was one of the key industries in Sumer. While pottery production increased significantly with the invention of the fast wheel, the quality of the pottery declined compared to the earlier handcrafted pieces. Previously, Yubayat people created high-quality pottery on a slow wheel, often painted with intricate geometric designs in brown or black. These pieces were considered luxury items and were only accessible to a select few. However, with mass production, the focus shifted towards quantity over quality. It was this complicated social hierarchy, large-scale irrigation, labor management, and the trade that led Sumerians to thrive and rise into city-states.